In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us together as leaders and workers in the vineyard of the Lord, in the church, in this church in particular. We thank you for what you've done in our lives until this time. I will thank you for the way you have made use of us, our services, our experiences, our devotion, our commitment. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing you have given to the work of the Lord in our hands in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that as we progress and move on in the work of the Lord, that this work will continue to prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. And as you seen us to be a blessing to multitudes of people, we pray that you also overload every life with blessing in Jesus' name. Bless your people today. And we pray that you strengthen us so we can strengthen others. Build us up that can build others up, edify us that we can edify other people too. We pray, Lord, that every good thing we need, you grant unto us. So we'll become better, richer, higher and greater in the service of the Lord. Confirm your blessing upon every life. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. I want to appreciate the response we're giving to these meetings we just started this year. And I pray that the Lord will bless your faithfulness in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And today we're looking at verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As you look at that verse, the very last verse of the chapter, it says, therefore. Why is that there? Why is he saying therefore? It's coming from the very first verse and it's telling us some things and, and then as it comes to the conclusion it says, because of everything I have said from the very beginning of the book itself and in particular from the beginning of the chapter it says, therefore my beloved brethren then he tells us what we are supposed to do. Let's say uh, before we look at the therefore and before we look at what we are to do as a result of what he has been saying let's see what he has been saying I'm coming from, I'm coming to chapter 15 verse 1. It says moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and they, wherein ye are, ye are saved, wherein ye stand. It's telling us, number one, it says, I've given you the gospel, therefore, my beloved brethren, this is what you are going to do with that gospel. Then it goes on to say, I preached it to you. I declared it to you. I proclaimed it to you. And you accepted. And you received. And you are saved. And you are standing. It says because of that, this is now what you are to do. It's not just coming from the blue and isolating something and it's saying, go work. No, it says before you do that work, you hear the gospel. And before you go to do that work, you receive the gospel. And then the gospel works in your life. You are saved. And then it says, you are standing. It says in verse 2, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. It says, unless ye have believed in vain. I pray none of us will believe in vain. It's telling us that we have had the gospel. And that gospel has worked in our lives. Has transformed our lives. Has saved us because it has helped us we need to help others too it's like you fell into a well and you are not the only one in that well about 10 of you fell into that well and somebody came and he pulled you out with a rope and he says because I pulled you out look at the rope with which I pulled you there are still 9 other people remaining there he hands over the rope to you he says because you are rescued because 
because you're delivered, because you're saved, because somebody came and sacrificed and helped you, therefore you now do this. And as we know that other people labored, that we can get saved. Those who labored in printing the Bible, those who labored in printing tracts, those who labored in recording something, those who labored in establishing a, a congregation, those who labored in preaching the gospel, those who labored at the crusade, and those who labored at the pulpit in the church, and then one way or the other, it came to you. Now you are saved. It says, therefore, this is what you are now to do. Look at verse 3. It tells us the content of the gospel. He preached unto them. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, he says uh, that which I also received. He says, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He says, the work I did to bring the gospel to you, I did it according to the scriptures. He says, therefore, you are now to go and do that same thing, and you are to do it according to the scriptures that Christ died for our sins. And then in verse 4 it says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He said, everything I've done that made you to come, talking to the Corinthians, is because of Christ's death and Christ's burial, and Christ's resurrection, and it's the power of that resurrection that came upon your life, and because of that power that reached out to you, and now you're saved, and you're transformed, and your life is totally different, it says therefore, my beloved brethren, this is what to do. Come to verse 9. It says, I'm the least of the apostles, that I am not, I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. It says anybody there thinking that uh, you are bad in the past and because you are bad in the past you think now you don't have any authority and any right to preach the gospel to other people. It says think about me. I was bad too and yet God changed me and transformed my life and sent me to go and preach the gospel. It says therefore my beloved brethren you see what he's saying? He's saying that because I say this and because I experience this and because this is where I'm coming from myself Maybe that's where you're coming from. You look at your past and say your past was dirty and your past was terrible. But now you are saying you're a child of God. He said, the same way it happened to me, let it happen to you. Therefore, you go and preach the gospel. He's saying in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. He said, I received the grace of God, and thank God it was not in vain. And he's passing it on to you, asking the question, have you got the grace you are saved? Are you sanctified by grace? Has the grace of God sustained you and helped you? He said, I didn't receive the grace of God in vain, and I'm believing that you will do the same thing. The grace of God has come into your life, and therefore you will not receive the grace of God in vain. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast because of that grace that came to you. And then he goes on to say in that verse 10, he says, that grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labor much more abundantly than they all. I labored more abundantly than they all. He's uh, telling us there to avoid the temptation of looking at the people in front of us. He came into the church before me. What's he doing? He came to the Lord before me. What's he doing? And she came to know the Lord before me. What's she doing? Many times we're looking at the people in front of us. The people before us and we're saying, well, if they try to minimize their energy and minimize their work and minimize whatever they do. I think I need to be wise to you. These people that came before us, they're not doing as much as I'm doing. Therefore, I need to slow down. He said, no, not at all. You are called by yourself. And because you came by yourself, he says, whatever your hands fight to do, you do it with all your strength. Never mind what the people before you are around you, what they are doing. He said, I'm even the least to be called an apostle. And yet, you know, I give all my my strength to this and I labor more abundantly and we can tell he traveled more than all the apostles that were before him. He wrote epistles more than all the apostles that were before him. He reached many people and many places more than the people that were before him. And he says, now can you st stand back and think back and see what you have done in the house fellowship and see what you have done with the children work and see what you have done in the women ministry, see what you have done with the campus or 
the student or anywhere the Lord has been pleased to place you. Are you doing it more than the people that came before you? And more than the people around you. And then he goes on to say, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And if you had that grace, you will have that grace. And then he tells us in verse, in verse 11, he says, Therefore, whether it be, they were, whether it were, for whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. And now his study is going to tell us that it's not all easy. You know, sometimes there are people that say, if it goes well, if it's very easy, if it's very smooth, I'll do the best I can. What if it turns the other way? We're looking at uh, verses 30 to 32. From verse 30, it says, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour. Why stand we in jeopardy? You could have said every year. That is, once in a while, in a year we stand in jeopardy. He said no. He could have said, every month, why stand we in jeopardy once in a while in the month? You know, a month will not pass. There may be a day or so we experience difficulties and challenges. He could have even have said every day. But he said every hour, every hour. But that did not stop Paul the Apostle. There are people that are looking at the wind and they are hearing the, the they are seeing the signs that dazzle. And because of that, they will not do anything. They said, I would have obeyed that verse of scripture. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain, why it not for the difficulties I have? In my family, there are some challenges. In fact, I would say that they are depressing challenges. In my place of work, there are some real conflicts and challenges, and it's, uh, it's difficult to eat even breathe and to even live. And as we look at, uh, you know, my extended family, uh, this pressure and that pressure, why it not for that? I could run like other people are running. Paul the apostle said, but look at the, the way we're doing it. It says in verse 30, we stand in jeopardy every hour. I protest in verse 31, by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily that he said things upon that it's just like you, you have given your life and you have said whatever it is let it come and we're moving on that means then whatever challenges you have been thinking about hindering us and whatever it is the confinement or or the pressure or the persecution that is uh, hindering us paul the apostle says there's no excuse he says i have been there and he said i am still there and maybe tomorrow it will still come he said but that will not stop me it will not stop you whatever is happening in the city whatever is happening in your village whatever is happening around you will not stop you it says in verse 32 if after the manner of men i have fought with the beasts at ephesus what advantages it me if the dead dries not let us uh, eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die it's saying that uh, you know the challenges are so great he even mentions a particular city in ephesus he said that is what we have gone through but all the same the work goes on and whatever is happening around us the work is going to go on transportation is there work is going to go on there's no transportation we have to walk there of course we'll do that work will go on the, the duty you have the responsibility you have you're going to carry it out whatever may be happening around you and that is coming to you something future he's talked of the past he's talked of the present he's talked of what he preached and what he went through now he's going to talk about something in the future look at verse 51 behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast and unmovable yeah abounding in the work of god it says because of the hope of the rapture and because of what is going to come because of the joy we're going to have because of the reward we're going to have it says therefore my beloved brethren get going and do the work of god because in verse 52 in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump it says uh, at the last trump the trumpet shall sound for a trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed can you say that with me and we shall be changed can you say that aloud and we shall be changed. because 
because of that hope, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There are three things we are going to consider briefly before we pray. Number one is constancy. Constancy. It says that in that verse, always, 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 there's constancy there. Number two is courage. Always abounding. Always abounding. Already has told you he faced challenges, he faced persecution, but he said all the same. Then you have to have a courageous mind, a courageous heart. And it's not difficult to be courageous if you know that the Lord is with you. You. If you know that he has told you, go ahead, and because I have much people, many people in that place, and nobody will set their hands on to hurt you. And you know that your colleagues have passed on the fire. Shedak, Meshach, and Abednego. Your colleagues have gone to the lion's den. Daniel, your colleagues have faced Pharaoh and uh, Moses, and your colleagues have faced uh, Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah. Your colleagues have gone through whatever you are going through today, and God saw them through. It says, because of that. There must be courage. Don't ever give any excuse because of this, because of this. I cannot do what I'm called upon to do. Number one, there is constancy. You will not drop the work of God. You'll not give any excuse and say because of this, because of this, I cannot go on. If you don't go on and I don't go on, you don't do it, I don't do it, who else will do it? We're going to do it. We're going to work for the Lord. And whatever comes and whatever does not come, this work, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. Constancy, courage, and then number three is conviction. Conviction. We need to have conviction. There must be something you're sure of. There must be something that you know. Uh, let, let, let me explain that word. Uh, you know, when you say, you know, uh, there is sometimes we'll say, I believe this, I believe this, I believe that. That's wonderful. For you to believe this, that's wonderful. But sometimes uh, we go beyond believing to knowing. For example, if I say, uh, are you a man or, or a woman? You'll not say, I believe I am a man. You go beyond believing. You say, I know that I know for a certainty that I am this. Is there heaven? You go beyond, I believe there should be heaven. Is there hell? I believe there should be hell. You know, you know for a certainty that there is heaven and there is hell because Jesus went there and is our savior and we pray to him, our father, who art in heaven and he answers our prayer. We know that he's, we know it's not just that I believe and then it comes to a point whereby you no, look at this. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Tell me what follows. For as much as she know. This is not just, I think, I hope, I believe. It says, don't you have this conviction? As much for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, God will reward you. And when you think of the reward God is going to give you, and I know if I give one, he'll multiply it by 100. If I give my time, it's going to multiply that time and give it back to me. If I give my strength, it's going to replenish my strength. Anything I give, I lay on the altar for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That knowledge will bring conviction, and that conviction will make you work, and then God will work for for you. It'll work for your family. As you're taking care of other people's children, it'll take care of your children. You take care, take care of other people's uh, lifestyle and everything, it'll take care of your life. Let's come back to number one now. Number one is constancy always at the Lord's work. Constancy always at the Lord's work is giving us work to do, and because of the work is giving us to do, we commit ourselves to that. It says, Because of all these reasons, therefore, my dearly beloved uh, uh, brethren, uh, always you must uh, be steadfast in the work of the Lord, and then you are always, always, always abounding in that work. Actually, in Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, I'm reading here from verse 34. 
It says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Listen to this, and to every man his work. And to every man his work. I hope you are not thinking that the work you are doing was given by brother so and so, pastor so and so, sister so and so, uh, mommy so and so that gave you the work. No, this was given by the Lord himself. This is the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ is gone to heaven. He's gone on a far journey and he committed something into your hand. And when he has committed something to your hand, you know that this came from the Lord. This came from the Lord. He gave Gave to every man, he gave to everyone, a brother, a sister, a young person, whatever the ministry may be, his work, and commanded them, the porter, to watch and understand what he has committed into your hand. And he may use a Paul to give you that work to do, he may use a Moses to call you to get that done, or he may use an Elijah that Elisha is pouring water on his hands, he may use Elijah to tell Elisha, This is what you do, but it's God. Don't you see that uh, God did not talk to Elisha by name directly, saying this is what you'll do. But he told Elijah, he said, Elijah, you'll anoint this, anoint this, and then that person called Elisha, you will also hand over to him. But didn't tell Elisha anything. And so you understand that when God has called you, he may use to David or Elijah, or Daniel or Samuel or whatever, but is the one that committed it into your hand. In Second Timothy chapter 4, Second Timothy chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 5 it says but watch thou in all things watch thou in all things endure afflictions paul the apostle did not uh, leave uh, timothy in the dark to say everything will be on a bed of roses you're leading that South Fellowship, it doesn't, you know, everything will be easy. And you're leading that zone, that district, everything will be all right. And you're a group, a pastor, that thing will be all right. Overseer, state overseer, region overseer. There'll be no challenge and no difficulty and there'll be no opposition and there'll be no conflict anytime. No, not at all. Paul, the apostle was very clear. He said, endure afflictions. What do we do in life that we won't uh, endure affliction? If you're not willing to endure some challenges and some difficulties, you'll never get anywhere in the world. Whether it's a secular work or spiritual work, whether it's the family or bearing children or rearing children and raising up uh, any business, it takes some challenges. And it's telling us that if you're going to succeed there, thank God I see successful people here. You will succeed in Jesus' name. But Whatever that success will attract, it will attract some difficulties and challenges, endure afflictions, do the work. Do the work of an evangelist. Uh, the work evangelism is not, uh, you know, it's not child's play. It's a work. So winning is not a child's play. It's a work. Or uh, you know, preaching the gospel is not a child's, It's not entertainment. It is work. And it says, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. He said, uh, I'm Paul. I'm doing it for myself. Timothy, I can't do it for you. You must do it yourself. I and you must do it for yourself. You make full proof of your ministry. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. I'm looking at uh, this uh, uh, Second Corinthians chapter six, and I'm reading from verse one. Second Corinthians chapter six, and we're reading from verse one. Uh, here it says in chapter six, verse one, talking about who we are and the work we do and the uh, success we ought to have. It says we then as as what? Tell me out loud. Walk us together with him. That means we are not alone. I say that means we are not alone. There's a challenge there. Let's say, for example, you have a senior, a senior partner. And this uh, senior partner, you are going to do a particular work together. And then you are to be there at 8 o'clock. And the senior pa partner is there. And you are coming in at 8.45 at 9 o'clock. And you're always doing that. I'm always apologizing. And the senior partner is saying, don't you think that if anybody ought to be busy, I'm busy. I'm in fact busy than you are. And yet you never never come prompt. I never come early enough. And I'm always here. Partners together with God. Workers together with God. And God is always there. 
and then you're staying back at home and then you're because of a little challenge job we can't even call it a headache just a, a little bit of fatigue a little bit of tiredness a little bit of a challenge or maybe a little discussion with your wife a little discussion with your husband and then there is something that somebody just a sentence and it upsets you and then you forgot your senior partner at the work with workers together with God and you are not there and because uh, you are not there the Lord is watching and he's not going to do it by himself neither is he going to employ an angel to do it and because we are workers together with God he says I beseech you not to receive the grace of God in vain you'll not have the grace of God in vain and look at the way Jesus did the work when he was here on earth and the same thing he expects of you and expects of me in uh, John chapter 4 I'm reading here from verse 34 John chapter 4 verse 34 Jesus said unto them my meat is to do the work of him to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work at the rate at which you are doing the work God has given you will this work ever be finished and the way there's no plan there's no deadline there's no goal will this work ever be finished jesus had a limited time here on earth and he said i am going to do this work and i'm going to finish it i pray you'll finish yours and look at all the people that got called in the bible they finished before they left and why should it be an exception with you that you'll not finish you will finish but then if you're going to finish you need to address yourself to that work and give yourself to that work we're looking at philippians chapter 3 philippians chapter 3 and uh, i'm reading uh, verse 13 there philippians chapter 3 and we're reading here from verse 13 in verse 13 it says brethren i count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing i do but this one thing i do but this one thing i do for getting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before it says i'm going to finish and i'm going to finish well if i'm going to finish well i have to come the work that is done that's done and settled and i'm not going to go in to, to going over that every time that is done that's all right i forget the things that are past and then i reach forward to the things that i need to do i want you to think of these uh, of this uh, phrase one this one thing i do this one thing i do i want you to combine that with uh, first corinthians second corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six we're looking at verse four remember this one thing i do second corinthians chapter six and we're looking at it from verse four it says but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of god listen to this in much patience in affliction in necessities in distresses what's paul saying paul is saying in his life in his ministry as he went through the work there were times of affliction necessities distresses but this one thing i do he never left that challenges were there but this one thing i do persecution was there but this one thing i do look at uh, verse uh, five in verse five it strives but this one thing i do in imprisonments but this one thing i do in tumors in labors in watches in fasting but this one thing i do he said i, I can't predict all that that one is not under my control challenges come i can't control that persecution comes i can't control that challenges of the day and challenges of the night the, i can't control that the one thing i can control this one thing i do this one will come this one thing i do advisors come this one thing i do persecutors come this one thing i do if you make up your mind this is what the lord has called me to in that youth ministry this youth work is what he has commissioned to my hands and this comes and that comes this one thing i do you're in the singing ministry and these challenges may come whatever and then you say this is what he committed to my hand this one thing i 
I do. You're in church of the women and you know that you have the goal. You say, God called me to this. And you prayed and he gave you the heart to do that. And this has to be done. And then challenges and conflicts may come. But this one thing I do. You are a pastor. And in the pastoral ministry, there are times people will say things they shouldn't say. They will do things they shouldn't do. They will react in every in ways they should react to you. Don't they know I'm a pastor? Don't they know I'm, I'm this? What do they put me on the mud and then they are trampling over me? Or oh, I'll say whatever. This one thing I do. You have that in your mind all the time. That's what helped Paul the apostle. It will help you. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, uh, By honor and dishonor, by evil reports and good report, as deceivers, they slandered him, yet were true. It says, this one thing I do. They slandered me and the stories are coming back to you. Things you never said. And things you never did. And they dishonor you and disgrace you. And then they make you so cheap like almost a piece of paper. You say, it doesn't matter to me. This one thing I do. That was a thing in the mind of Paul the Apostle. This one thing I do that made him successful. This is going to make you successful. That in the midst of those uh, deceptions and discouraging things and all those uh, slanderous things, you still say, this one thing I do, you will succeed. Look at verse 10, a sorrowful, at that time, so been sorrowful in your life, you know, it's Saturday night. Something happened. It was a big bang. And then you have to preach on Sunday. And you say, I'm sorrowful. And with the sorrow in my heart, my heart is heavy. And since my heart is heavy like this, why do I need to deceive myself and say, I'm going to preach tomorrow? But you remember this one thing I do. I'm sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. As then it says, as poor, we don't have what we're going to, you know, make yourself to be able to make ends meet. And the children are. You know, going back to school, and now we're going to rake everything together to pay school fees as poor, and yet make him any rich. This one thing I do as having nothing, yet possessing all things, we we'll possess it by faith, and we we'll possess it. We know it's in the bank of heaven, and we know it will come. But at, as at now, we have not seen it in the physical. But whether I see it or not, this one thing I do. That's what made Paul successful. That's what will make us successful. We're looking at chapter 11 of uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I, I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes Often it strives above measure, and then it says, In prisons more often, and in death's art. It says, I mean, the prison at this time, but this one thing I do. The confinement is there, but this one thing I do. It tells us in verse 24 of the Jews, uh, five, uh, five times received thy 40 stripes, save one that is 39 stripes. They'll tie him to the post like a criminal. Because that's what they thought of him. They thought he was a criminal. He's, a, he's a boycotting, abandoning Moses, and he's lifting up Jesus Christ. And he said, This is the only way that, except you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. You can go through all the laws of Moses, all the rituals and ceremonies of Moses, it will not save you. And he himself used to persecute people that forsook Moses. And so they tied him to the post and gave him 39 lashes. He wasn't a boy. He wasn't a young person. This is an adult, and this person, even at the profession, he was a tent maker. And they, they overlooked everything and tied him to the pole, and they gave him 39 lashes. After the 39 lashes, he says, This one thing I do. They called him another time because if he had stopped, when they lashed him and when they whipped him the first time, they would not whip him again, but he, he continued, This one thing I do. This man said, In the midst of suffering. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of indignities that they might do to me, this one thing I do. Look at uh, verse 25. In verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, and in the night, a night and a day have I, have I been in the deep. Then he said, this one thing I do. 
The challenge accidents even happen. This one thing I do. Look at verse 26. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. Watch Paul the apostle, that's it. In perils of robbers, in perils uh, by my own countrymen, in perils by the, the hidden, in perils in the day, in perils also in the wilderness, in perils in the, in the sea, in perils among, tell me, false brethren but this one thing i do you know sometimes uh, many people can suffer many things but when people they trusted him that's a believer that's a child of god that's a member of our church i remember i've helped him a lot in counseling and now he turns against you and it's like uh, why should i continue you should continue because this one thing i do false brethren are there the people are there and all those challenges are there but all the same this one one thing I do in verse 27 in weariness and painfulness and in watches often in hunger and thirst and fastings often in cold and nakedness but this one thing I do this one thing I do he didn't allow anything to stop him he remembered that word always 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 abounding in the work of the Lord I pray that that word always you remember in Jesus name and what should you be doing now always preaching always reaching out to the lost always witnessing evangelizing soul winning always teaching other people that need to know the word of god more than they know now always training training others and training workers always preparing saints for the rapture always discipling the converts always and then singing and ministering to the needs of people as you minister you give to them always if you remember always there will be no week will pass by that you'll say well i think i want to go on vacation paul the apostle said he never went on vacation all the things that he needed to do, what he told other people, he himself carried out, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's come back to second, First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, I, I think we can say, we can even go beyond what I read before in uh, First Corinthians chapter 15, that you know this, this, and this. We can say, look at Paul the Apostle. Look at what he went through. And uh, you will never go through again what Paul the Apostle went through. Nobody is going to tie you to a post and give you 39 lashes with uh, sharp stones and sharp metals at the end of those uh, of the stripes. Nobody is going to do that to you. Nobody is going to beat you with the rod of the Jews. Nobody is going to do that to you. You're not likely to go through shipwreck and through, go through all the robbers. You're not likely to go through a, a fraction of what he went through. And we are saying that if Paul the Apostle, if he went through all that and he never left that word always, always, always abounding. And he said that this one thing I do. I believe that if God helped him with all the challenges of his life, the Lord will help us you in particular the lord will help you you know six you are thinking this is so big and this is so great and this challenge i never saw anything like this before uh, paul the apostle says pay a visit to me and let me show you the magnitude of what i went through and yet that man wrote all these epistles and that man preached in all those places and that man trained all those ministers and that man converted all those sinners and that man went to all those idol worship she passed in Athens and everywhere and preached the word of God to them of course if he did that you can, you must, you will therefore my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast or movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord always abounding in the work of the Lord we're looking at point number two now that's courage abounding as the Lord's watchman Courage, abounding as the Lord's watchman. And the Lord has called us to be watchmen. If you look at um, Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel chapter 2, I'm reading verse 7, then we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And this evangelism, the Lord is saying, we'll talk to those sinners. 
Oh, but somebody says, they aren't going to hear. He says, that's not in your hand. That's not your responsibility. Talk to them. Because Jesus died for everyone. And he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to, tell me out loud, every creature, every creature, whether they will hear or they will forbear. Well, they will say they have, they have their own religion. Don't speak into their mouths. Whether they will hear or forbear, speak to them. They will say they, they are born again already. Don't worry about that. It says whether they will hear or they will forbear, tell them. They will say that now they've heard of your church a deeper life and they don't want to hear anything about that. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about getting to heaven. I'm talking about what Jesus did for you. I'm talking about the fact that you need to give your life to the Lord. Turn away from your sin and come to serve the Lord. It says whether they will hear or forbear, you must tell them for they are most rebellious. God even said so. He said they were most rebellious. And so you will find here that God himself told them this is what they must do because we are watchmen. We're coming to chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kebar, and I searched where they search. And I searched where they searched and remained there astonished among them seven days. And there are some of us that are trying to pack out of where we're living. Oh, we see this uh, place is infested uh, with uh, this kind of crime, that kind of crime. I'm looking for a better place. I'm looking for a peaceful place. I'm looking for this and that. Who's going to reach them? If all of us Christians, if we go to a Christian village or we go to a Christian settlement or we go to a Christian establishment and we cannot live in the midst of the people and the Lord has sent us to them and now we have to live in a far place and we're coming like uh, visitors to that place. Ezekiel said I sat where they sat I dwelt where they dwelt and I was with them. I was astonished I was surprised at what I saw them doing and then it was in the midst of that a different message came in verse 17 son of man I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the watch at my mouth and give them warning from me. I've made you a watchman. You are his watchman. And we'll hear the word from the Lord. We've heard the word already. The word of salvation. We've heard the word already. The word of redemption. Christ died for them so that they can be saved. It says we should tell them that in verse 18 when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely doubt, die and thou givest him not one him, nor speakest to one the wicked of his way say to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Tell me the rest there. Will God do what he has said he will do? Do you really mean that? Did God mean what he said? Did he say exactly what he meant? His blood will I require at your hand. You pass them by every time. And all the, instead of speaking to them, you are afraid of them. You are not afraid of God. You are thinking, what if I talk to him and he shuns me? What if I address him and then he just pushes me off? What if he even slaps me? What if he abuses me? You are afraid of man. You are not afraid of God. And he says, I require his blood at your hand. Even people we should not be afraid of. The people we talk to freely on other things. We talk about economy. We talk about politics. We talk about news. We talk about current affairs. We talk about, you know, what happens in the market. We talk about exchange rate and everything. We talk about banking, about whatever it is. And we're free. We talk to them about everything. The thing that we're not pre profit them in eternity. But we do not talk about their souls. And the Lord said, I've given you an assignment. I've given you a duty, responsibility. Talk to them. There's nothing they're going to do because the Lord will protect you. 
and the Lord will preserve your life. I can imagine Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And then uh, Pharaoh said, don't talk like that again. And then God said, go back to him again. And he came again. That's the man coming. Let my people go. Moses, I said, don't. I don't know that God. I'm not going to listen to you. And then he came the third time again. Let my people go. I can imagine Moses going all the time. All the time. Because he was walking and was living. I seen the invisible. He wasn't thinking about Pharaoh. I'm not sure the people you are afraid of are as terrible as Pharaoh. I'm not sure the people you are afraid of are as uh, powerful as Pharaoh. And they cannot do on what Pharaoh could have done. Those days, you know what Pharaoh did. You know, he threw those children into the river. Nobody can do that to you today. Why are we afraid of them? And then you think about a person like Daniel in, um, in, in, uh, in Babylon. And as he was there, you know how Pharaoh was. If he interpreted the dream this way, if uh, Pharaoh was not happy, uh, sorry, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not happy, you know what he will do. But all the same, even when they signed an edict that anybody that prays to any other god on that Darius uh, the king, they throw him into the lion's den. He was not afraid. Now they face challenges we will never face. Nobody is going to throw you into the lion's den. And nobody is going to throw you into the furnace of fire. If they were not afraid and they did what they ought to do, we're not afraid. We're going to do the work of the Lord. In fact, I can almost imagine as David was talking to Saul and he said, you know Saul, uh, King Saul, I was uh, by my father's sheep. And when the lion came to take just one away, I confronted that lion. And with my bare hand, I smote him and he died. And then another time, a bear came again. Over and over and over, they were exposed to danger. But all the same, always about it. That's courage, that's courage. Now, that's why God looked at that man. If this man will keep animal like this, he will keep my people. And then he called him to take care of the flock. You know, sometimes there's a false prophet in the community. And then you know he's stealing. He wants to come and steal the members away and dare you on the pulpit and you know what is happening. You know the false doctrine they are preaching. You know what is confusing the people, the members of your local church and then you are thinking if I say that they will think I'm confrontational. If I say that they will think I don't have love. But you have love. You know you are protecting the members of your local church. You know you have to say that and if you say that in a parable you think they will not, you know they don't understand and these people that come to trouble and to take away the sheep they don't talk in parables they talk direct and they tell them what they want to tell them and they're very bold why is it that the enemy is more bold than you are now the lord is telling us if moses did what he did and david did what he did daniel did what he, he did and shadrach meshach and abednego they were courageous and they said what the lord has given us we're going to stand by you will stand a new day has come. A new dawn has come. And this new day and new dawn, you'll be bold for the Lord in Jesus' name. Number one, as his watchmen. As his watchmen. Number two, as his witnesses. His witnesses. We're looking at um, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, always abounding, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The Pharisees will try to stop you. And the Sadducees will try to muzzle you. They'll try to close your mouth as if don't ever say that again that Jesus is the only way don't, don't you know the community in which you are living don't you know around this place we don't accept that it's you that uh, don't accept that I accept it I believe it I know it is true and Christ is the only way we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 we're reading from verse 12 neither is there end is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were on language and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they, were, they had been with, with who? With, they saw, they saw. We can see. And the people we are talking to can see. If you are timid, they can see. If you are afraid of them, they can see. If you fear them more than you fear God, they can see. If you fear them more than you fear your own conviction, 
they can see. If you are afraid of talking to them, they can tell. Because it says they saw the boldness. From this day, they will see your boldness. The authority of the spirit that God has given you. Even when you are alone in the midst of a lot of sinners. That's a crusade field already. That's an opportunity for you to talk to them. And to talk about Jesus. And to talk about the Lord. And to talk about eternity. And you say it convincingly. And say it boldly. And when they see your boldness. They're not going to ridicule you. Slander you. Or look down you. They will marvel. They'll take knowledge. They'll say this person has been being with Christ from today that's what will begin to happen and then in verse 14 and beholding the man which was healed uh, standing with them they could say nothing against it but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council they conferred among themselves saying what shall we say what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people. But that it spread no further. Hold on. It spread no further. If those people had been cowards, we would not have got the benefit of hearing the gospel. If they had chickened out when they threatened them, if they were afraid when they threatened them, we would not have heard other people laid their lives on the line for you to hear, for you to be born again, and for you to have the Bible. All these things that are reaching for us, everything compiled together, everything printed, and now we can read, and now we can study, and we can prepare for heaven if other people did not a uh, kind of uh, stretch themselves out on the altar and do what they ought to deal without fear, without timidity, without cringing, without, uh, cr without uh, cringing before the people. If they didn't do that, we would not have got it. But they were bold, it's got to us. Because the people said that it spread no further. Now the people, maybe the people around you, they are saying that, that it spread no further. But we are going to spread further. They think it will spread enough. They think we have enough uh, local churches there. They think we have enough uh, districts, enough uh, groups there. But we're going to multiply. Yeah. Because this is our life's work. And whatever they say, they themselves, they are coming into the gospel. The people that are saying, well, not talk to other people. We are talking to them themselves. And they're going to come to know the Lord in Jesus' name. Because we'll speak in the power of the Spirit. We'll speak in the anointing of the Spirit. In the boldness, in the courage of the Spirit. And when God gives us that courage and we we'll speak to them, they're going to yield to the gospel. But they were saying that they spread no further. They said uh, among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak as for to no man in this name. And they called them. And they commanded them not to speak at all. Uh, not to speak at all. No teach in the name of Jesus. Look at Peter. Verse 19. I think this should encourage you. This is a person that has said he didn't know Jesus Christ, but the Holy Ghost came, he became a changed man. The Holy Ghost is coming upon you. Amen. You'll be a changed man and a changed woman. And where you were afraid before, you'll be courageous today in Jesus' name. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye. That's your business. But we cannot but speak the things which we have heard and seen and heard. We cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. They spoke. People were converted. Multitudes came to the Lord. And we have come to the Lord. And through us, more will come to the Lord in Jesus' name. Number one, we are watchmen. Number two, we are witnesses. Number three, we are workmen. It's workmen. And because we are workmen, we are going to work. You cannot be a workman and not work. In Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 7. Matthew chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7. And as he go preach, saying, 
and a seagull preach. A seagull preach. All right, we, we took, uh, we took uh, our understanding and conviction from there. We're going to the place of work. We will preach in the bus. That's coming back. I said that's coming back. What it takes the a seagull preach. That's coming back. We're in a train station or whatever, and I see go preach anywhere we go. We're going to preach, and you know, at that time, uh, and it's not uh, too many years ago, we had tracks in our bags, we had tracks around us with us all the time. And even when you don't have any chance to talk, you're giving tracks out, you're giving tracks out anywhere you are going, and we should saturate this city with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saturate every, every city and every local government and every community with the word of the Lord Jesus Christ as he go preach. Um, the, the districts uh, can, you know, get uh, hundreds and thousands of tracks and the groups can get thousands and hundreds of tracks and uh, every local church we get the tracks, the tracks are available there and we used to do that and it will be, the, anybody can come at any time they want to witness and then they go out and uh, they are able to preach uh, with those uh, tracks because with that track to your hand you can easily start a, cons a conversation you give it to him and then you say, now can I share with you what you have in that track, when you read that scene it's going to be a blessing to you and this is what you are going to read there and then from there we actually do the witnessing because we're witnesses says as she go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick you will heal the sick cleanse the lepers you'll cleanse the lepers raise the dead you'll do it in jesus name cast out devils freely ye have received and freely give provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor scribes for your journey and then it goes on to say neither uh, neither two coats neither shoes uh, for nor yet uh, staves for the workman that's it the workman we're workmen and we're going to do the work he has committed into our hands to do and because we are workmen there's no day that he said uh, you're not doing something you're not doing something for the lord you must be doing this the workman is worthy of his hire it says uh, we're watchmen it says we're witnesses and it says we're workmen and we're going to do what the Lord has called us to do in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 15 then I'll go back to verse 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 we're reading from verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 15. It says study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And that means uh, you know you are not lazy. That means you are not taking vacation every time. That means you are not giving excuses every time. You're showing yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That's the word. A workman. We're watchmen. We're witnesses and we're workmen. And it says a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Come back to verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What does that mean? It means you're a teacher, reproduce teachers. You're an evangelist, reproduce evangelists. You are children, church workers, reproduce other workers. Or you are working among the youth, reproduce other youth workers. You are working in the campus, reproduce other workers. You are working among the women, reproduce other workers. It says the thing that thou hast heard of me. Among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, those who have not heard, those who have not known, those who have not been trained, so that it's not just, you know, we have the all these uh, number of workers and full stop and nothing else but you reach out to other people those who are born again those who are children of god but they do not understand what it takes to be workers you can begin to train them disciple them edify them develop them challenge them even in your own local church where you are until now they are ready and they come to the open to become workers it will happen in jesus name the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also thou therefore endure hardness 
See what the Lord is telling us. He said it before in chapter 4 verse 5. He says it again. Endure hardness. In fact, uh, you are going to discover that, um, you know, the hardness we are talking about, these are not strange things. And that's why Peter, the apostle, was talking to the brethren. He said, you must understand that the same affliction is even on your people that are in the world. Even those who are in secular employment, they face persecution too. And those who are looking for promotion, they face challenges too. There's no challenge you are going to face that other people even sinners are not facing and if they are able to stick their neck there and put their um, shoulders to the yoke and they say this one I'm going to do this one go and ask our young people that are in colleges now sometimes in their departments the challenges they face and yet they say no matter what happens nobody will run me out of this college out of this university I'm going to have a certificate if our own children that came out of us young people if they are able to stick it out and they say i am going to get something done i think we papas and mamas i think we can do it i said we can do it and so nobody will run you out of ministry and say you cannot walk you will walk hardness may be there affliction may be there challenges may be there but you say challenges or no challenges i'm going to do what the lord has committed into my hands now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of jesus christ no man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier i come to point number three now and it's the conviction let's come back to first corinthians chapter 15 and we're looking at verse 58 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're reading from verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Here is a conviction of for as much as she know. Don't you have the conviction that God will do what he has said? Don't you know that he will reward those who are serving him? Don't you know he'll give a good pay to the people that are paid the price? He says for as much as she know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For as much as she know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Point number three, conviction dash assured of the laborers wages conviction as a dash there after that word conviction assured of the laborers wages and uh, you look at uh, john chapter 4 in john chapter 4 we're reading once again from verse 34 in john chapter 4 reading from verse 34 jesus spoke about himself and after that he passed it on to his own disciples and he's passing that on to you in uh, john chapter 4 verse 34 jesus says unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to tell me and to finish, you'll finish in Jesus' name. And to finish his work. Then he says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Then in verse 36, And he that reapeth receiveth wages. He that reapeth receiveth wages. He that reapeth, receiveth wages. The conviction that was shown that the laborers' wages will be certain. I want to ask you questions. Just think through this by yourself. Which one pays more? And which one pays higher wages? Caesar or Christ? Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then says he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. If Caesar will pay for your daily work, for your weekly work, for your professional work, don't you think God will pay? If Caesar will be faithful to pay you for what you are doing in that office, in that market, in that community, don't you think that God will be faithful? Now, who do you give more time to? If we look at your time, look at Caesar. Look at how much of your time Caesar is taking. 
Look at how much of your energy Caesar is taking. Look at how much of the development of your brain, your training, and everything Caesar is taking. Look at the little thing we're giving to God. Is this all that belongs to God? Or are we taking something belonging to God? Are we giving to Caesar? Caesar is having too much. The market is serving too much. And the employment is serving too much. We're giving too much of our time to them. Education is having too much. Extramoral studies having too much. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We're giving too much to Caesar. And we need to understand that God will pay more. God pays higher. Because he is God. And in eternity we're not going to miss our reward. And so you want to answer the question to yourself. Who pays you more? And who do you give more time to? Who do you give more of your intelligence to? Who do you give more of your training to, to Caesar or to God? I'm coming to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 7. Genesis chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 7. Genesis 13. We're reading from verse 7. As we look at Lot and Abraham, we look at their workers. It says, and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between the herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we, are, we be brethren. And it is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right hand. If thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he beheld all the place of the of a Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou goest, as thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lord chose him all the place of Jordan, and Lord journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other and Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom verse 13 but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly I'm asking the question again who does he pay to serve Lot or Abraham Look at the servants of Lot. They were committed to him. They were faithful to him. As Lot moved with all the cattle, all the herd men, they also moved with Lot. But do you know that all of them perished? Do you know that when Sodom was burnt, all of them was totally burnt? There are many people that they are working in a place, and then the Lord, that is the director there, wants to move to another place. And they don't worry that they'll miss the Bible study. They'll miss uh, being a leader in the church. They'll miss all the opportunity of serving the Lord and helping other people to know the Lord. They don't think about that and they move with the Lord. And when they move to the new place and then whatever happens over there, they're not under God's protection. Because God has special protection for the people that are serving him. For the people that lay everything on the altar. And they're serving him. All these uh, people that moved away, no devotion, no worship anymore, no teaching anymore and there's no influence of Abraham upon them anymore because after all we must eat and we must work and the work we're employed in is the work of Lord they could have told Lord eh, sir if you move I'm, I resign I'm you know staying with Abraham stay in a place where the word of God will continue with you in a place where the work of God will continue with you rather than moving with Lord stay with Abraham I'm coming to Exodus chapter 3 Exodus chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 1, Exodus chapter 3. We're looking here at verse 1, Exodus chapter 3. 
and we're reading from verse 1. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father, his father-in-law, and the priests of Midian, and he led the uh, flock uh, to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even unto Horeb. This is where he saw the burning bush. And the Lord now began to talk to him. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said, the Lord began to say something. Look at verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. And you understand that uh, Moses was the, in the employment of Jethro. And Jethro was the father-in-law. And the, the, this employer had given him a wife. And through that, he had got two children. And Moses will not say that Jethro did not treat him well. He treated him well. It was a good employment he had. But now the challenge came. God was getting him out of that employment. He was giving him another job. Come, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. And Moses thought about it, who will give me a better pay, better remuneration? Who will give me a better reward, Jethro or God? And he made the right choice. He knew that God's work will pay better. Do you ever think about the work you do and the work God is giving you to do? And think about what result are you going to have? What if Moses said, I don't want to break the heart of Jethro. He doesn't have a replacement. He doesn't have an alternative. And if I leave him, I've been working with him for these 40 years. And if I forsake him now, I, I should be very thoughtful. I should be very careful. And I should consider this thing I'm saying is the will of God. And God is calling me to a new work and I'm 80 and this man has taken care of me in my position of a refugee all these all these many years but you know that God has called I must answer the call of God God is calling you you will answer the call of God it may not necessitate your leaving your employment but at least that you give God good time that you give God something of quality that God will know that you are really serving him and you're making comparison if I spend all my days with Jethro and I've spent all my energy and everything when I come to the work of God, I'm dozing, I'm already tired, I'm worn out, I'm giving the leftover unto God. How does that really pay? And how does God appreciate that? Is it a Caesar or Christ? Must be Christ. Is it Lot or Abraham? Must be Abraham. Is it uh, Jethro or God? Must be God. Uh, we have uh, one, one man, an intelligent man. I, I'm, I'm reading his story to you in Second Samuel. Second Samuel here. I'm reading from chapter 16. Second Samuel chapter 16 and I'm reading from verse 23. The man was so intelligent. In fact, people thought that any time he gave any counsel, any advice, he was a special person, a special, um, you know, they call them special advisor in this, in religion, special advisor in politics, special advisor in uh, warfare. And look at this in verse 23 of Second Samuel chapter 16. And the counsel of Ahithophel when he counseled in those days was as if a man has, uh, has inquired of the, of the oracle of God. So with, uh, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel both with David and Absalom. Now Ahithophel had a choice to make. Uh, he, could, uh, he was working with, uh, with David. And uh, David was the older man. But you know something about David? That's David. I found a man, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Now, Absalom rose up. Absalom never heard from God. Absalom was not chosen by God. Absalom was not placed there by God. It was just, you know what we're talking about, the loss of the eyes and the loss of the flesh and the pride of life. He wanted that position by all means. And even if he'll destroy and kill his father, and then Ahithophel thought, uh, the man is getting old, David, and this young man is rising up for one reason or the other. I think I know the reason why, but all the same, that's not the, this is not the point to discuss the reason now, but he joined with Absalom. Salon. And he, he still retained his knowledge. He still retained all the good uh, counsel he could give. And as he joined with uh, Absalom, he should have thought, which one will pay better? Think about eternity. And think about the will of God to keep on working with David or to work with Absalom. Let's see the result in his life. I'm looking at chapter 17. In chapter 17, if you read verse 1, he gave his counsel.
concept. If you read verse, if you read verse 14, you will see how that council was defeated. And now let's come to verse 23. In verse 23, it says, And when Ahithophel saw that his council was not followed, he saddled his ass, and he arose and got him home to his house and to his city, and he put his household in order and hanged himself and what? And died and was buried in the sepulchre of his father. Where is he spending eternity? In hell. He joined Absalom. Now that you have a good understanding, you have counseling, you have training, you have wisdom, you have experience, it was given by God. And then you go to put that knowledge, that understanding to help a rebel and to help somebody who is going to kind of uh, destroy, destroy the will of God and the mind of God and the plan of God. Of course, that will not be right. And when he tried to do that, he couldn't get through. And after all, they didn't even appreciate his counsel and all that he wanted to give. He went and hanged himself and not just because of that. He's not spending eternity in hell. Think about where you're serving. Think about what you're doing. Are you helping a rebel? Are you helping a false prophet? Are you helping somebody who is trying to destroy the work of redemption and destroy the plan of God on the son of David that God had chosen? And you think about Nimrod and Noah. Nimrod and Noah. Nimrod was the one that built Babel. And uh, Noah was the one that built the ark. He's building, whether it's the ark or Babel. And there were people that used their intelligence and their knowledge. And they say, we're going to build with Nimrod. We're going to build the tower of Babel. You know what happened? God came and scattered the work of their hand. I see you are giving your energy, your life, into something that God will scatter. And God will say, let us go down and see. If they need to do this, he said they should replenish the earth and scatter all over there earth and he said no we're going to contradict God let's all come together and build this time going to going to heaven that will touch heaven and God said no you will not do that and he scattered them I pray God will not scatter the work of your hand we as Christians do we ever think what am I building am I building with Nimrod am I building with no it's not just to build it's not just to sing it's not just to minister it's not just to labor see where that labor is going to and then we have, you know, it's a pity. When Saul, the son of Tarsus, when he was persecuting the believers, there were people that followed after him. In fact, it tells us who your Bible to Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. And here now we're reading from verse, uh, I'm reading from verse 6. In verse 6 of Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Acts, we're reading from verse 6. And, and it says, I'm trembling. And I was astonished and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The man that journeyed was seen stood speechless, hearing a voice, and seeing no man, and saw arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he, alone by himself, was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. How about all these people that journeyed with him? How about the people that supported him when he was persecuting Christians? And when he would take them out of their houses and put them in the prison, all of them, when he encountered the Lord, and when he encountered salvation, and when the Lord called him, by the time he became Paul the Apostle, all those other people that served him in his days of sinning, they were nowhere to be found anymore. They preferred to serve Saul. They didn't prefer to serve with Paul. How about us today? Who are you serving? And where do you put your energy? That's why the Lord is telling us, I'll come back now to uh, the text we're looking at today. It says, uh, therefore, as we consider all this, as we listen to all this, it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be steadfast, let's be very thoughtful. Where do I put my energy? Where 
do I put my strength? Where do I put my knowledge? What do I support? What am I going to do? How do I spend my life here on earth? Am I going to work for something that will perish or something that will last for eternity? Be steadfast, or movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as she know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Your labor will not be in vain. This one you are doing will be rewarded here on earth. It will be rewarded in heaven. Even your secular work, the Lord prospers that because of what you are doing with the Lord. And if there's any challenge to consider, my time, I don't have enough time. And then what do I cut down? You know, there are people, I'll call them unthinking people. They're not thinking through. If they say that I don't have enough time, what do I cut down? Unfortunately, it's the work of the Lord they cut down first. They say, I cut down this, I cut down this. And because I don't have enough time, I'm going to preserve the time of Caesar untouched. But I'm going to cut down the time I give to God. I, I don't want to, I don't know what word to use. Permit me to use the right word. It is foolishness. I said it is foolishness. Don't you say it is foolishness. Talk now. It is foolishness to cut down the time of God and increase the time or preserve the time of Caesar. Give to Caesar only what belongs to Caesar. God, our creator, and God, our redeemer, he demands all. He deserves all. He's prepared heaven for us. Mansions in heaven is going to give us something that we, nobody else can ever give us. If we're going to cut down time on anything, it's not the time we give unto God. We will serve God more. You will serve God more, and the Lord will bless the work in your hand in Jesus' name. Therefore, because of all this, brother, because of all this, sister, be steadfast, be immovable, always, always, always abounding in the work, the work of the Lord, because you know, you now know. Do you know? Where are you? You know, for as much as you know, that your labor, praise the Lord. Your labor will not be in vain. Amen. You will smile. Amen. You will laugh. Amen. The Lord will reward you. Amen. He'll bless the work of your hand. It's a new year. It's a new vision. And it's a new perce perception. We're going to do it. Rise up and let us pray. And you tell the Lord, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Commit yourself to the Lord. Think through on all this. I say, God, here am I. Here am I. Not less, more. Not something lower, higher. Serve the Lord.